Step by step, heart to heart, left right left, we all fall down like toy soldiers. Welcome back, everyone. I am Un, your sad, strange little man, and I thought I'd take a little break from Dark Souls 2 in honor of Alicia's recent run of Clockwork Night 2 and take a look at a very different platformer about toys come to life, 1995's Biomechanical Toy. This one's something of a rare bird being an arcade game from Spain. It was created by the late Spanish developer Zoo Software, previously known for the Amiga game Risky Woods, and brought to market by Spanish publisher Galeco, best known for the pale shadow of Crazy Taxi that was Smashing Drive, and also for a shitload of electronic dartboards. Biomechanical Toy seems to have quietly come and gone without much recognition or distribution. I was a pretty well-traveled arcade hunter in the mid-90s, and I never once saw a BMT machine in the wild. Perhaps arcade operators didn't have much interest in anything outside of the fighting genre at the time, or maybe it was Galco who lacked faith in the ability of a Toyland running and gun to resonate with the Mortal Kombat crowd. Either way, it's kind of a shame because I really like this one. Its music is blatantly sampled from various movie soundtracks, but aside from that, it's very well made. Controls are tight, graphics are bright and expressive, and perhaps surprisingly given the theme, it ratchets up the intensity to near Gunstar Heroes levels at times. This one can be wrapped up in less than half an hour, so join me, won't you, for a short but sweet trip through an overlooked gem from the Iberian Peninsula. Bad news! In the last few hours, the famous criminal Scrubby escaped! Scrubby was imprisoned for trying to rob the magic pendulum. Now in freedom, he swears to carry it out. Meanwhile, elsewhere, the toys enjoy the life the magic pendulum gives them. Without a doubt, they are thankful to Relic, the cuckoo clock that guards the pendulum, watching their world. Suddenly... Will someone be able to help us? Perhaps it's not too late. I am Biomechanic Man! Toy, whatever. You know, I've played through this a number of times and I still don't know what the biomechanical part is actually about. But never mind that, let's put in our virtual quarter and get the show on the road. Thank you for coming, Ingus! Hurry up! Recover the pendulum before our world disappears! And so we set off on our way, or THE way, as the game prefers to name it, and we'll be starting off in the Crazy West. Yes, it's Biomechanical Toy, starring Ingus, who is apparently some sort of Steven Seagal action figure. And as you can see, we can fire in the four cardinal directions, as well as the two upward diagonals. We picked up a bit of ammo there at the beginning, and I'll talk a little more about ammo as we go along, but first, we're gonna make our first rescue. The Buffoon Curlic. He's got a pogo ball. I had one of those as a kid. Never got any good at it, though. Anyway, in each stage there will be a captive toy we can rescue, and they'll follow us around for a little while and provide a little supporting fire. But there he goes. They don't last very long at all. Anyway, as you can see, we've been picking up ammo, and there is an ammo counter in the lower right corner of the screen. You can be pretty liberal with your ammo, you really don't have to worry too much about running out, because the game does give you plenty, and you will need to spam it around pretty regularly. And even if you do run out, all that does is remove your ability to fire your standard double shot. You'll just fall back to an unlimited ammo single shot, which just doesn't do as much damage. So even if you run out of ammo, all is not lost. And here we introduce the balloons, which come in purple and red flavors. Purple balloons just hold things for you. You shoot them down and you find power-ups inside, like so. Food just restores health, and here's our first boss, the Wizard Queen. She's pretty basic. She just teleports to the left and right of you in a cloud of smoke, sometimes shoots electricity that you can duck under, or a ground-level fire that you can jump over, and every now and then she'll turn into a regular enemy or a mid-boss type. I think there's another appearance of that floating horse that we saw earlier. 
Here we've got what I think is a rook. We're seeing some enemies more associated with the next level, the chess level, in this one. And when you wear down the Wizard Queen, for some reason she goes all Violet Beauregard. And that is that. And with that, the wind will pick us up and... Oh dear, that's disconcerting. But yes, that will move us on to Chess Valley. Those eagle statues, I have no idea what they do. In the lower left you can see the game does track how many you pick up, and it continues to track that throughout the game, but I honestly have no idea what they're good for. I mean, I've, I've collected up to ten. Uh, the flags there, when you activate one of those flags, as you might well guess, that is a checkpoint, and uh, getting killed in this game does drop you back to the last checkpoint, so you do want to make sure you activate them whenever possible. Our next rescue will be the Genie Ogui. Oh, Mr. Ringus, sir, what will your pleasure be? Ah, but I didn't finish talking about balloons, did I? Because we had a boss pop up. As I was saying, the balloons come in purple and red. The purple ones uh, just are containers for power ups. The red ones you can bounce on, and sometimes if you do so with sufficient skill, you can find your way to secret areas. We're gonna have a situation like that right here, where all the beehives are. You have to bounce on some bees, then up on the red balloons and collect some power-ups, and I assume that eventually leads to something good. I know I've done it before, but I don't remember what's up there. It's a little tricky, and so I'm not going to kill myself trying to do it this time. Uh, something else I should note, uh, you've seen we have quite a good-sized health bar, and by picking up fruit or other kinds of food, we can increase it a little bit. Uh, don't let the size of that health bar deceive you. Getting hit by almost any kind of enemy or projectile takes off a lot of health, so yeah, you can see it right there. So in practice, you really can only take a few hits. Gonna try and bounce on these balloons, and there we go, we'll get a little extra food and pump up our health a bit. Some extra point items. That's how secrets generally work in these games, you have to either bounce on enemies or balloons, or both. And you just find your way up to things if you can avoid falling. This section's a bit tricky, the timing of the darts is not really well synced to your movement. And if you get hit by the darts, you take a goodly chunk of damage. That was actually one of the better times I've had getting up there. It's actually a pretty common place for me to find my first death, but I actually made it through this time, so yay for that. Those gangsters slash cowboy enemies that we've been seeing since the beginning, they're not very quick on the draw, as you've noticed by the fact they haven't actually shot at me yet, but they fire plungers if you give them enough time. Something you've also seen is that we can bounce on top of enemies, but the positioning for such is fairly... fairly precise. You have to get right on top of them. So it's usually not something you want to risk unless you have a good reason to do it. Another checkpoint for us, which is good because I'm fairly low on health next hit from just about anything is likely to kill me, and there we go. I really kind of jumped right into that, and I'm not sure why. Just had a wandering brain moment, I suspect. But we're making fairly reasonable progress once again. And with that no smoking sign, we're about to be introduced to a rather weird little enemy, which is these cigarette caterpillar things. Uh, by the way, we saw one in the first stage, but I didn't have a moment to comment on it. Sometimes we see those flying magician hats, and if you shoot them, they will drop point items or power-ups. And so you just want to shoot them until they go away to make sure you get all the stuff you can get out of them. In this location, where we are being picked up by the wind, you would think it would gradually waft us up, and it does, but you actually have complete control over your movement here. You can press down to drift downward. Uh, touching those bomb icons, as you saw just there, will destroy everything on the screen. And every now and then they're quite rare, but you can find gun power-ups. We found the one here that causes us to fire exploding bullets. And that will last for the remainder of our current clip. Or until we die. The power-up balloons here, you want to make sure you get right under them before you pop them, because 
If you don't, the item will fall off the screen and be lost forever. You cannot go down and get it because it will fall below the wind. Lost a banana there, but life goes on. I really wish I knew what those eagle statues do. You would think the game would make that fairly clear because they're important enough to keep track of, but no, it really never does explain them. And you might think it's one of the sort of thing that you collect enough of them and you get a one-up, but I mean, that's possible, but I've certainly never been able to pick up enough of them for that. Anyway, our next boss here is the Flying King. Don't know if that's supposed to be some sort of pun on the Lion King or not because he is literally a flying king, it may just be what he is. And you can jump on top of him, as you just saw there, for a little bit of damage, and that can actually be a pretty good way to keep yourself out of trouble during this fight. Helps you get to the other side of him without risking going underneath him where a lot of his attacks come from. Pretty easy boss. Actually, most of the bosses in this game are pretty easy. The levels are generally a lot more dangerous than the bosses are. And he's already taken care of. And our floating island here begins to explode and drift back to Earth. And that will bring us to our next stop, the Train to Hell. Well, that escalated quickly. And indeed, this stage will be an escalation, because this is where Biomechanical Toy starts to really rank up the difficulty. We'll start to see something the game is very fond of doing here, which is trying to pin you down in an area with constantly spawning enemies. Lots of places the enemies will just keep coming until you move on. You can't just uh, get rid of the entire stream of them. And this is the first stage where that really becomes an issue. You have to make sure you keep moving forward whenever you have an opportunity to do so. And here's our next rescue, the Dragon Wolgrim. Gotta love his little aviator cap and goggles. It's awfully cute. Anyway, we would normally have an opportunity to bounce up some red balloons there, hopefully get a few more point items, but I think Wolgrim actually destroyed some of the balloons for us, so not very helpful on his part. But there's never anything super important on the, uh, on the balloon and enemy bouncing secrets. Usually just point items and maybe a little bit of food, so no big deal. Those gate enemies there, we'll be seeing a lot of those. They're kind of annoying. Uh, when they're facing you, they will shoot a high-level uh, high projectile that you have to duck under. You shoot them for a bit, and uh, they turn around and shoot a low projectile, the timing of which can be a bit tricky to jump over. It usually comes out a little bit later than you expect. At least it does for me. And if you approach them and get too close, they will spin around and whack you back a good way, so you'll lose some progress that way. So have to make sure you don't get too close to them, don't try to jump on top of them. Right where I got there, that's about as close as you can get to them without them flinging you backward. But we're making good progress, we have reached the engine. And if you blow up the key here, the train will stop. Notice it is a scrubby train, uh, themed train, and it has train to hell helpfully stenciled on its side. Anyway, you might think from that that there's no boss here. That must be someone from the dev team's kid. Anyway, you might think there's no boss here, but after we get off the train, we will be zapped into an electrical socket, and that's where we find our boss, the virus. Kind of a strange thematic fit for a train level, but whatever. I took a completely needless death there. But the virus's biggest threat really is pretty much exactly what happened to me there, which is that it will pin you into a corner. Because it will always drift towards you, and sometimes you don't have a great opportunity to get over it. So you want to make sure you either get a chance to slip under it or uh, lure it upward with one of the springs, or just spring over it before you get pinned down. That it happen to me twice there, but at least you got to see kind of a neat little detail, which is when one of its projectiles hits you, it will kind of dissipate in a cloud of zeros and ones. Notice there's a bit of Japanese text on the computer there. Wonder if that's a brand name or some sort of reference. If anyone can translate that, I would certainly be interested in knowing what it says. We're doing a little better this time. I'm getting into my groove and I think we'll be able to pull out the win here. You also may have noticed that when you die to a boss, it doesn't get all of its health back. It recovers some, but some of its health remains gone, so 
If you die a few times on a boss, you can gradually whittle it down. Bit of mercy on the part of BMT. And we now move along to the Wood of Clocks. And we get our rescue right at the beginning, the Fairy Rachel, who has a nice eight-way shot. The increase in intensity that we saw on the Train to Hell definitely continues here. We get lots of flying enemies spawned from the clocks, or sometimes just hanging around. We get these uh, little ghouls and ghosts type uh, mace men who take a few hits to bring down, so their uh, gradual encroaching on your space can be a bit more of a threat than previous ground-based enemies. Every now and then we get these holes in the backdrop that spawn those enemies with the hook and eye screw hanging out. I'm not exactly sure what that's supposed to indicate, maybe some kind of clock component, but you want to stay in place and just shoot them all down there because they will stop coming, and if you try to move forward while they're continuing to spawn, you're likely to get yourself in trouble. Generally speaking, in the at levels from the Train to Hell onward, you will, as I said before, want to keep moving when the game gives you an opportunity, but every now and then it shakes things up a little and you want to stand your ground and clear out a cloud of enemies. Because not all enemies are infinitely spawning, just certain places that'll happen to you. Now the platforms here making up this bridge, if you walk across them slowly you generally won't have too much trouble. Uh, they only really shake up when you jump on them or move quickly. But the enemy spawns there didn't really give me an opportunity to take it slow. Anyway, our next boss here is the alien, for whatever reason, in a wood... Uh, in a wood... Uh, can't talk here. In a woodland stage based on clocks. Don't know where the alien's coming from, but he just warps back and forth, spawns enemies from his mouth. No big deal. Just make sure he doesn't uh, warp in on top of you, because that hurts quite a bit. And that's the wood of clocks. Next stop will be the Dragon's Tower. Because, hey, what kid doesn't have some medieval fantasy toys hanging around the bedroom? And we continue to have the, uh, the Mace Men, the little goblin dudes who are quite thematically appropriate for this stage, and the, uh, the floating sort of ghostly wizards who are a real pain in the ass because they move erratically and take a good few shots to bring down. They can definitely, uh, encroach on your space a good bit. Also, they can spawn in right in front of you, which is another pain in the ass, but we've got a robot named Mako, so I think we're gonna be just fine. Well, maybe not. At least I died pretty close to a checkpoint there, so we didn't lose much progress. As the game points out, we get an extra life of 5 million points, and that is, uh, an indicator that this is a very high-scoring game. Indeed, we are already at 3 million. This level can pressure you a good bit, not quite as much as the Train to Hell or Wood of Clocks, but it is more merciful than most about giving you checkpoints, so yay for that. Now this area you want to take reasonably slowly, make sure you uh, get rid of those enemies uh, spewing the spider webs at you from the walls. I'd still love to know what those eagle statues do. If anyone uh, has experimented with this game or wishes to experiment with it and has any clue about that, I would really love to know. Now those... Uh, plant enemies, the stationary ones that spew the vine balls at you, those can be a pain in the ass because they, they like to pressure you. 
if you get them into stun lock, then you can just burst them down, but if you give them an opportunity, they will just spam those uh, vine balls at you constantly, and those do damage as well as immobilizing you for a moment, so that can be a real point of aggravation, especially when other enemies are around. Oh, got a little careless there, and yes, uh, falling into the water is an instant death. This is definitely a game where you can have uh, occasionally those Castlevania type deaths where uh, where an erratically moving uh, enemy will just give you a big old knockback into a pit, because this game does have quite a bit of knockback. Oh, lost my stun lock. Ah well. Made it out okay anyway. Something I touched on early on in my introduction is that the uh, soundtrack for this game is largely lifted from movie soundtracks. You can tell from the sound of it uh, that the um, that the background music is largely made up of samples, and yeah, they're generally taken from movies. Uh, one of them I know is Passenger 57. I'm not sure what offhand else has been sampled for this game, but yeah, apparently, uh, much like Thunderblade. Copyright was not a big concern in uh, Biomechanical Toy, and we have reached the dragon. Now, you might think this is entirely a minion boss, because we just have these plant things that spew out little dragons and occasional projectiles, which thankfully we can deflect with our own shots. But no, that's just stage one of this boss. Just make good use of your diagonals, make sure you get rid of any uh, dragon minions and projectiles before they start cluttering up the screen too much. And that's simple enough, and we move on to the green dragon. Now you want to be mindful of those fire plumes he breathes out, because those do turn into ground flames that you'll need to jump over. Occasionally he swoops through the background and gets to the other side of you, so thankfully you don't have to worry about getting to his other side very often. And he occasionally fires small projectiles, those you cannot deflect unlike the larger ones from the plants. Another fairly easy boss, all things considered, though. Only way I could really see you dying here is if you get caught by surprise by the ground flames. And there we have it. Oh, hey, Wolgrim. I hope we didn't just, like, murder your dad. That's alright, he was an asshole. And hey, we have a bonus stage. The only one in the game. If you get a hundred coins here, you will get an extra life. I generally do not pull it off, I think I have once or twice, but uh, you have to be pretty on point with your shot placement here, and the pigs do fly by pretty damn quickly, so you don't really get a lot of time to adjust your aim as necessary. You can't really miss too many, there aren't a whole lot more than a hundred here. The coins get slurped up by that sort of toll booth there. If you don't make it, then uh, Rachel will show up and drop the additional uh, coins you require to pay your admission, but you will not get the one up. And now we are on to our final stage, the Wildland. And this is where Biomechanical Toy completely stops fucking around and gets completely batshit with the enemy spawn rates and just pins you down unmercifully. Picking up the ammo there does remind me that you briefly saw in the bonus stage I did run out of ammo there and had to fall back to my uh, single shot. But all that does is a little less damage. Not really a major concern. And the game is nice and quick to uh, provide me with some ammo replenishment. Now the orange dinosaurs are one of the several ways in which this level will pin you down unmercifully. The bouncing skull ghost things here. Shades of Castlevania being one of the others. And in this case, we have a big-ass crowd of both. Yeah, getting out uh, of this section without taking a death is no joke, and getting out without taking a hit, well, I don't think I've ever achieved that. Oh, ho, ho, pterodactyl out of nowhere. And as you can see, there's no mercy for you when you respawn from a checkpoint. It will resume blitzing you immediately. Those little uh, plant sort of growth things there that spawn out the centipede enemies definitely do not help matters.
We have a rock slide warning there. That indicates that that area is going to fall away from you as soon as you set foot on it, so something to be mindful of. Nearly got careless with my timing there. But hey, fries! And here we find, in a sort of basket cage, our next rescue, the Ogre, Khan. And Khan's appearance and behavior lead me to think that someone involved with the creation of this game was a fan of Magic Sword. Because if you ever played that lovely little Capcom uh, hack-and-slash platformer, there was a character you could rescue and uh, who would become one of your party members named the Big Man, who was a big, prehistoric man with a boomerang axe. Much like Khan. Man, Khan left really quick. Usually, uh, you know, they never are around for a particularly long time, but usually your your toy allies last a little longer than that. It's a shame, because this is certainly a level in which we could use a little more supporting fire. A uh, very welcome uh, bomb icon there. And a little food, but sadly not enough to allow me to take an additional hit, With w which with the rain of skulls, projectiles, and pterodactyls here, I expect I am probably going to die. No? Holy shit, I can't believe I made it through that alive. But I ain't gonna knock it. Now there, uh, at the bottom, is the only turkey I'm aware of in the game. There might be another somewhere in one of the bounce uh, bonus areas, but that will give us a full health restoration, and it was one sorely needed, so thank you, mysterious hovering turkey. And we have arrived. You might think once again that there's no boss, but we slip into a little building there, and finally, Scrubby! Oh, Scrubby. You know, I'm, I'm kind of digging the uh, the regal crown and wizard robe, but the giant diaper with the oversized novelty safety pin on it? Not a good look for you, dude. Anyway, Scrubby is vulnerable in the head, and you want to keep a pretty withering rain of fire down on his head area. Make sure he stays on the move and doesn't hang around too long in any one place, because the more opportunity you give him, the more he will get chances to attack you. And his attacks all involve using the magic pendulum he stole from the Cuckoo Clock Relic to summon minor enemies, mostly bees and spiders, occasionally lightning bolts like so. And probably hardest to dodge is when he summons a rock fall from the ceiling. You just want to make sure you have a your eyes cast skyward so you can quickly respond to that. But even being probably the hardest boss in the game, with the possible exception of the computer virus, Scrubby is not that bad. This game just doesn't really place a whole lot of difficulty focus on its bosses. The real trouble is just getting to them. And that's it for the Crypt of Scrubby. Finally, Scrubby has been defeated. With this, his terrible reign has also ended. It's time to return the magic pendulum to Relic the Cuckoo Clock, so he can bring peace to the world of the toys. Happy End! Ah, and we get a lovely photo with Inga's just uh, having a little victory snap with all of his allies. And that is it for Biomechanical Toy. As I mentioned, a fairly short game. Pretty uh, typical length for arcade game run-throughs, I suppose. But, uh, yeah. Really good game, in my opinion. The uh, whole sampled background music thing is a little sketchy, but... Yeah, I'm sure uh, Zeus didn't have a whole lot of budget going on this. As I said in my intro, it controls well, plays well. Graphics are pretty nice, and of a style you don't often get to see in arcade games almost an enhanced Super Nintendo kind of style. 
I like the way the intensity the intensity ratchets up, keeps you on your toes. Just a pretty solid game, and I'm sorry it never got uh, more recognition or more distribution. Again, I never saw one of these games in an actual arcade. Don't know if they were any more common in Europe. Anyone from across the pond, uh, feel free to weigh in on that. But in any case, we have reached the end of Biomechanical Toy. As always, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this brief interlude in Midsummer Night's Fling, and I'll be back soon with more Dark Souls 2. For Ingas, Relic, and the rest of the gang, I am Un, this is I Played a Thing, and that's game, Hendrix. A big biomechanical thank you to all the steadfast toy soldiers of the Patreon, including Justin Carpenter, Nolden, Zangamarth, Charlie Dunst, Anonymous Benefactor, John Madigan, Sanguine Games, Misha Van Doren, Craig Patterson, Frank Grizzy, Tim J, Lolo De Puzzlo, Joshua C. Ritchie, Jared C. Rice, Darren Chow, Sonic Rose, EX Potemkin, Alicia Goranson, Argyle Jelly, Mechazorus, DG Jono, Doug Russell, August Fortnite, Patrick Bellinger, and the rest of you very generous contributors. Commenters, subscribers, and watchers are of course very much appreciated as well. Thank you all, and I'll see you again real soon. Take care.